So we know Jesus is thinking about that verse. And the most obvious thing is because that's in Matthew and this story is in Luke, that it's one mind that comes up with those two parables. Welcome to the Science and Faith Podcast with Dr. James Tour, and I'm James Tour. And uh, uh, you can see my professional credentials at jmtour.com or the social media site, which is drjamestour.org. Uh, and uh, my producer is Eric Heron with, um, with philosopherfilms.com. And we're filming today in the studio associated with one of the campuses of our church, and this is the Cross Point campus. And I just want to start out by saying again, I'm a practicing scientist, but I love Jesus more than anything else in the world. Jesus is just terrific and, and uh, means so much in my life. And if you don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, I urge you, please reach out to me. You can send me an email to tour at Tour. Dot org, and I will reply back and we'll set up a time, set it up by Zoom, and I will share with you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and why I believe, and you'll get saved that very day. Just just give me the opportunity to share with you, and I'd love to do that. And uh, with that backdrop, let me introduce to you our guest today, and it's Dr. Peter J. Williams, who's the principal, formerly called the warden, and he's the CEO of Tyndall House and a member of the Faculty of Divinity in the university, at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, that's actually a, quite a high position. Uh, he received his, all his degrees, well, it was MA, his MPhil, and his PhD uh, in languages related to the Bible from Cambridge University. And after his PhD, he was on the staff of the Faculty of Divinity at Cambridge University. Then he uh, went on to a few other places, and now he's back at Cambridge in a senior uh, a, a, a de, as deputy head of the School of Divinity, uh, uh, but then in, in July 2007, he became the youngest uh, uh, CEO or, or what we now call principal in the history of the Tyndall House. And that's the, uh, this, this facility at Cambridge University, at the University of Cambridge, where they really study the Bible and they, lots of scholars there. And so uh, the person with me today is not a scientist, but he really knows the Bible. And I was just asking him about this. How can he put up with people like me that know so little about the Bible? But he's humble enough to say he learns from people like us. And with that, I just want to introduce Peter Williams. Great to be with you. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, um, today we're going to be speaking about his book. His book is uh, Can We Trust the Gospels? It's Crossway 2018, and it's available on Kindle, and it's available in the audio version. And can we trust the Gospels? That's an interesting thing. So I'm going to be asking, uh, asking you, Dr. Williams, Dr. Peter Williams, about this. And uh, um, let's just start out with this. What do non-Christian sources say? Are there people in the non-Christian world that, that have really brought substance to this in mm -hmm. this era, talked about this? So there are a, a couple of... Well, th three, I, I think, really significant sources. There are a, a few more, but three that I particularly uh, find helpful, which talk about Christ or Jesus Christ early on. One is Cornelius Tacitus, the Roman historian, who's writing about something that happened during his childhood in the Great Fire of Rome in the year 64. And he talks about how Nero, the Mad Emperor, blamed that on the Christians, or he probably spells it Christians, but it's a group he says are clearly named after Christ, who suffered, uh, was um, executed under Pontius Pilate uh, in Judea. So he confirms um, the basic narrative of sometime between 26 and 36, um, the uh, uh, that uh, Christ Christus was put to death by the Romans there in Judea. So that fits the biblical narrative. Another case would be um, Pliny who's governor of, of northwest Turkey, uh, Bithynia, and he writes to the emperor, maybe around the year 112, give or take uh, one or two years, and he uh, talks about how he's having difficulty with all these Christians and uh, the uh, showing there how widespread Christianity had become and describing how in the early meetings they are treating uh, Christ and singing to him, and he says in Latin, quasi Deo, as if to god um and you might say well that could just mean a god in latin but it's very clear 
Christianity arises from the cradle of Judaism. Uh, Jews only have one God. They are, these pe people early on are treating Christ as that God. And he's describing what's going on in meetings, not just in his own time, but actually 20 years earlier uh, that, that people have been talking about what's going on in Christian meetings. And then a, a third case is a Jewish historian, uh, Flavius Josephus. And he writes uh, in uh, the uh, Antiquities of the Jews, he's got two passages where he mentions uh, Jesus Christ. One of them uh, in book 20, where he talks about how um, uh, the brother of Jesus Christ called James, and of course, he's someone who's mentioned in the Gospels and the book of Acts, um, uh, is uh, killed, and it seems because of his belief, um, uh, during a power, a power vacuum, say uh, around 61, 62 uh, AD. And uh, that again confirms part of the biblical narrative that even Jesus's brothers came to believe in him and uh, James came to head up the early church. So th those are some uh, things that you can derive from non-Christian records without um, uh, uh, needing to go to the New Testament. Of course, the New Testament gives you a far bigger picture as it should. Mm -hmm. Before I get to that, you said something that, that, that I want to follow up on. You're saying that even in these, these non-Christian texts, they're suggesting that these first century Christians were looking to Jesus as God? So yes, what, uh, it's very clear in um, Pliny's text that he has got this test for whether people are Christians or not. And it's, are, are they prepared to worship the Roman emperor? Are they prepared to worship the Roman gods? Um, and he seems to think that's a sufficient test. Clearly that shows that the early Christians aren't just prepared to worship multiple beings. Um, and that shows that they are continuing the Jewish practice of only worshiping one God. He then says, just a very short while later in the text, he says, here they are, they meet on this special day and they're singing to, to, to Christ quasi Deo, as if to a God. And that seems to be suggesting that somehow they are identifying Christ as the God of the Jews. And that's, of course, something that you see in the New Testament. And that's the astounding claim. So it's not that gradually over time, people began to have more and more exalted thoughts about Christ until eventually he evolved to the position of being accepted as uh, the God of the Jews, because mathematically that doesn't work. There isn't an evolutionary path um, whereby you can go from being sort of a bit God to quarter God to half God to one God, because you can never have one and a half gods, one and a quarter gods in Judaism. You've just got one God. God isn't a quality you can slice up or anything like that. God is a being, and Christ is identified as that being. Well, that's, that's news because so many people say that that concept of Christ being God came much later. Mm -hmm. But this is this is in the first century right there. Yeah, that, I mean, that's yeah. clearly what's implied now. OK, mm -hmm. Tastus is writing in the early second century, but, but he's describing what's been reported to him by people who've left the Christian faith, talking about what they were doing in their meetings, even up to 20 years earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So that gets you into the first century. First century. Right. Now, now, how about how about the gospel writers themselves? Aren't can't you just say, well, they're, they're enthusiasts, they're they're going to be biased in what they write if you look at the, the writers of the Gospels themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should never um, confuse people's passionate interest in something with the reliability of their account. So if someone accuses you something falsely, you have a passionate interest in defending yourself and people shouldn't write off your defense just because you have an interest in that. Um, most of the people who write about American football or soccer or, or, or golf or anything are enthusiasts of that. So we would expect, of course, most of things written about Jesus Christ are by enthusiasts of Jesus Christ. That does not mean you should dismiss them. And then you have to look at the text themselves and sh see, do they show signs of reliability? And we've got we've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Is that enough to really build substance upon? And, and uh, with that, tell us tell us about where they were written. And, and is it you know, many people will claim that the Gospels were written way after the events and, and uh, outside the land. Just tell us about this. So I'd say four is a lot, um, particularly for someone who's not from the Roman elite. It's as many as you have of the most famous person in the Roman Empire at the time of Jesus, namely the Emperor Tiberius, and the four accounts of Tiberius, well, three of them are further away in time 
than we have with with the Gospels. So I think th uh, four is an abundance. I'd also say that they're quite optimally arranged. That is, we have three that are more similar, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and one that's a, a bit more different, namely John. And that means that we can do a bit more archaeology than if we just had four books, because we can actually um, start looking at, say, say, material that's only in Matthew and Luke. We've got material that's only in Luke, material that's only in, in Matthew, material that's in John, material that's, say, in Matthew and uh, Mark or Matthew, uh, Mark and Luke. And that means that you can start seeing are these signs of reliability in all these different sorts of texts. Naturally, I think that um, to have a three plus one arrangement is the optimal way of having four Gospels. If I can just uh, dwell on this a little bit yeah, longer. Yeah. Imagine if you had a two plus two. So there's two that are quite similar and another two that are quite similar. Let's call one big A, another little A, another one big B, and the other one little B. What you would think is really you've only got two sources there because you would think one comes from the other. So you'd think you've only got two. If you've got um, four, which are all equally different, well, all you've got is, is just four. But to have this three plus one, it actually is an amazing thing. It gives you five or six or, or more different sorts of material. It means that you can subject them to scrutiny in a way that you just couldn't otherwise. Uh, so I think it's really optimal. It's very economic. Of course, they're God could have made it so there'd be even more Gospels, but then it, it would be quite tiring. <laughs> um, and, and what we've got, I think, with this three plus one arrangement is really good. Uh -huh. And 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 what what about this this idea that it was uh, uh, written long after uh, the 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 events that occurred? So I, I think the great thing about the Gospels is that they're long enough after the events to be unreliable and short enough after the events to be fully reliable. Uh, so so. I mean, something could be reported the very next day unreliably. And so at the end of the day, um, you have to then dig down into it and say, which uh, which is going on? And that's where I think when you look at the, the actual text themselves, you can see all sorts of hallmarks of reliability. Of course, it's possible uh, for uh, things to be changed over time. And in that sense, a skeptic can always say you've not quite proved your case. I mean, in the Old Testament, it's got this... Uh, story about how Moses uh, came down the mountain of Sinai with these tablets written by God. Well, even if you had a photo of him actually coming down the mountain, someone could always say, well, what did he do before he turned around the corner in the mountain? So you can never get close enough that you can prove it to someone who just doesn't want to believe. But what you can say is there's absolutely no reason not to believe, and there's all sorts of signs of reliability here. So when we look at these texts, we see signs that were it not for the miraculous claims, people will be treating this as uh, reliable. Were it not for the fact that actually it implies claims over our lives, people would uh, treat it as reliable. But actually, because humans like their own autonomy, they want to be in charge of themselves, that's where people actually don't like uh, often what you find in, in, in the New Testament. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to follow up on this concept of, of of uh, being outside the land, you know, were these things written in Rome, for example? Well, mm -hmm. tell us about geography. Did, did the gospel writers know about, really know about the geography of the land? Why, why couldn't they have been written by some committee in Rome or something? Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to remember how difficult and expensive and potentially dangerous ancient travel was. Uh, so that's where writing about something happening in a foreign country, you're going to make a huge number of mistakes. Um, and what we see is from the gospel writers' knowledge of the land of Jesus, Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to call it, uh, from their knowledge of that land, it's very clear that either they had been there or they had had very, very detailed interview conversation with people who've been there. That's the only way you can get it. You can't really get that information from any books that we know of. Um, and the gospel writers are correctly describing where the land goes up and down. So the verbs to go up and go down when they're talking about Jesus's movement are used in the right ways. And that sort of topographical information is, is very non-trivial. So just when it will describe Capernaum as by the sea, it knows it's next to the Sea of Galilee. It will talk about going down to Capernaum. And when Jesus is there, he will be talking about um, better for a millstone to be hung around someone's neck and thrown to sea than that they um, offend a little child. And 
we find that Capernaum is a center of millstone production. There are lots of millstones you can see there today. So all of these sorts of details uh, are amazingly uh, fit with what we know. And um, it's the fact that it has those things right, not just geography, but all sorts of other cultural things right, that really tells you this is the, the simple explanation is that someone was just there. And we can all write about things that happen in our own town that are true. We don't, it's, it's actually very easy to tell a true story. The effort has to come in to make up a story. So in terms of inference to the simplest explanation, uh, that would be that these writers are telling the truth. Okay. so. This is interesting. You said they said the right, the, the proper direction, up or down. Mm -hmm. I so I go to to uh, to Israel every few years because my daughter lives there, and uh, I remember before there was GPS available, I would get lost all the time because in Jerusalem there's no grid pattern. It's mm -hmm. the roads go every which way, and I would stop and I would ask people, and they would say, "Turn here, then go up, and then go down, then go up, and." So they added a third dimension that I was not used to because mm -hmm. in Houston, you just say left or right. You're only mm -hmm. dealing with two dimensions. They add this third dimension of up and down, exactly what the Bible mm -hmm. does. So everything is in relation to this third dimension, which becomes quite confusing. Mm -hmm. if, if you weren't, if you don't know this, you're thoroughly confused. And it never helped me to stop to ask anybody because it just <laughs> got too complex. But um, what about, you know, we, we mark things at times before GPS rendezvous was very hard. Mm -hmm. Remember, we would have to say, we couldn't just say, you know, I'll meet you in Houston. You had mm -hmm. to say exactly what corner and which, which corner and which store you would stand Some landmarks in front of. you'd point yeah, out. Yeah, landmarks. Yeah. And so tell us about trees or something or landmarks that, that, that these folks may have used because people who only have grown up with GPS have no idea how hard it was to describe a particular how to get to a particular place so what you find is for instance when it describes in the four gospels the triumphal event entry of jesus he's coming down the mount of olives it's telling you there's a mountain just next to jerusalem it gets it on the correct side so he's approaching um it uh after journeying to jerusalem that you go over that mountain uh in the general approach from galilee um then it's telling you there are olives there. Of course, it also uh, knows there's an olive garden there, the Garden of Gethsemane. It manages to give it a proper local name, Geth and Semane. Uh, and then uh, it gives you the villages of Bethany and Bethphage. Um, and then you, you find that uh, it, it will also give you um, the palm branches. So it, it's got um, knowledge of, of botany there. And in uh, Luke's gospel, Jesus is coming from Jericho and Jericho is the lowest city on earth. It's got a different climate uh, from uh, Jerusalem. It's uh, sometimes called the city of palms um, uh, because of that. But it's also got these sycamore um, uh, trees, Ficus sycamorus, and that's what Zacchaeus is described as being up. So it's got these sorts of things um, correct. Uh, and uh, it, it's astounding also that at Jesus's um, death, uh, his death is described uh, as being close to a garden. We now find archaeologically there were gardens just uh, near Jerusalem at the time um, in, in that area. So it, it all fits the, the micro geography of, um, of, of this area. It knows it well. Yeah. And you, you get at this in your book mm -hmm. where, where you really give these details. Now, I've been to Jericho. There is a big, big, wide sycamore tree there. And they told me that that's the tree that Zacchaeus climbed up. <laughs> so they still point to that tree. Yeah. But it, it's, it's really interesting. Now, now you tell me, t you have this, this big word that, that Wikipedia uses, disambiguation, mm -hmm. in your book. And you, you talk about this in relation to names, in mm -hmm. relations to speech. Explain that to us. Yeah, so uh, your gym tour, Dr. Jim tour, uh, where there are loads of gyms. Yeah. And so if we just say gym uh, and we're in a wider context, that won't be specific enough. And uh, back then, y you had the fact that the, the most common uh, name for a uh, Jewish man uh, in the land of Israel was Simon. And so if you just call out Simon, people don't know who you're talking about. That's why when we look at Jesus' list of 12 disciples and he's got two Simons in there, um, and it's the most popular name. One of them is Simon Peter or Simon Cephas. The other one is Simon the Zealot. 
sometimes called Simon the Canaanite, which is um, means is another word of zealot, and there's some linguistic knowledge shown in there. Um, and what you find is that in the Book of Acts, say Simon Peter goes to say with Simon the Tanner or leather worker. Uh, there's Simon the leper who doesn't see uh, people having a meal with him. He doesn't seem to be a leper at the time because people are having a meal with him. Maybe Jesus healed him. Um, and, and you get uh, mm. Simon of Cyrene um, who carries the cross. And so and all the of the uh, magician. <coughs> Isn't there Simon, uh, Simon Magus? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so all the most common names are getting this extrovert, uh, and it happens with the Mary, the most common female name, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and so on. The second most common name, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, and, and so what you find is that it happens with those names and not with the less common names. So you, you find with your Bartholomew, you don't need to say anything uh, uh, more about it. With a Thomas, you don't need to say anything more about it because it's a um, it's a name that, that's less common. So uh, um, that's where we're finding that the gospel writers reflect the naming patterns of the land from which the stories originate. Uh, they get the right relative proportion of, of those names, broadly speaking. Um, they uh, are distinguishing the most frequent names. Um, and uh, what's really interesting of course that names are really hard to remember uh it's called nominal aphasia that we keep on forgetting names um and what we find is that uh names are hard to remember stories are easy to remember and so the striking thing is the gospels are correctly getting this thing that's the hardest thing to remember if they can get the, the names right it's easy to get the stories right um and so this is showing us that the names are are there with the stories from a in, in a sense, the first generation of storytelling. It's not something that happens several iterations afterwards in a sort of um, telephone game uh, sort of analogy where third or fourth hand, these things are getting repeated. That just wouldn't make sense of the data we have. Yeah, it, it, it's striking the number of names that are given. Nobody tells a story generally in our culture and gives all these different names. Mm -hmm. Even when, when I watch a movie, you forget the names Absolutely. even of, of, of actors and you just, that are right in front of you. And yeah. if you have more than two or three names, it gets quite yeah. confusing. Yeah, you remember the role the, the, that's played, the storyline, but but the actual names. Right, and this is why I often yeah. ask people, I say, what 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 do you do? What's your occupation? Where are you, you know, and then it clicks with me. When I have a, a man's occupation, then mm -hmm. it I, I really begin to, mm -hmm. to, to, to have their name. And um, when I was a boy, most people, they, they had a name and they had a nickname attached that kind of described something about them. And if, if, if someone was thin, you know, they, they, they would be, be tacked on to their name. But because of these days, you, you can't do that because it's considered impolite or not woke enough. But it was much easier because mm -hmm. a, a name was attacked. If, if, if a person had red hair, they were called red. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that just just went along with them. So so you see the same sort of thing in in the Bible. You know, mm -hmm. you, Simon the Tanner, Simon the Magician, and it, mm -hmm. you attack on their occupation. Yeah, yeah. And then you begin to remember it. And how about with the name of Jesus? Jesus was that was that a fairly common name? And and does that help to distinguish our gospels that we we observe versus the gospel, let's say according to Thomas or of Mary mm -hmm. and these things. So Jesus was a common name, about the sixth most common uh, name at the time, uh, and that's based not not just on the New Testament, but looking at Josephus and other ri writings from the times, Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, and so on. Um, and what's very interesting is that in the gospels uh, you've got three sort of different ways of referring to Jesus. You've got his own preferred self-designation is the Son of Man. That, that's what he refers to himself as. The narrators, the gospel writers, uh, call him Jesus. And, you know, if, if you don't notice which Jesus is, you need to start reading again with having drunk a bit more coffee. Um, but the characters in the narrative on the whole call him Jesus plus something, which is exactly what you would have had to have done at the time in order to... Um, pull him out from the crowd. So uh, you will see that um, Pilate will say to the crowd, what you want? do you want me to do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Or, or people will call out Jesus Rabbi, Jesus Son of David, all sorts of different ways that people address Jesus. But there's, there's a, uh, most of the time there is a disambiguator there. Like the Nazarene. 
Yeah, Jesus of Nazarene. Yeah. And so when a servant girl comes up to Peter saying, um, who, who's in the high, high priest court and says you were with uh, Jesus of Nazarene or you were with Jesus um, of Galilee, uh, that's that's the sort of that's specification we get. Right. Because there were other Jesuses probably in the court. And, and, and how, how is that different in some of these other Gospels that we don't really accept among our four? But uh, how are those different? So I think sometimes a name can get so famous over time that you don't need to put a uh, disambiguator on. So there are, just as there are real banknotes, there are fake banknotes because the real ones exist. And because there are real gospels, there are also fake gospels that come along in the second, third century. And what you find is those fake gospels, often called apocryphal gospels, don't have the same naming pattern. For them, Jesus is already a famous person. They don't need to uh, have any disambiguation when people refer to him. And they also don't have the same palette or knowledge of um, of names from the surrounding culture. So they just don't have that sort of level of specificity. And often when you're reading a gospel, like one of the fake gospels called the Gospel of Thomas, you have no idea where this is all happening. It's a list of, it's saying, these are the secret sayings, which the living Jesus spoke and which Didymus Judas Thomas wrote down. And that's how it begins. And they're saying it's secret sayings because they sort of got to explain why no one's ever heard of them before. But also you don't know whether the living Jesus is in heaven saying them or in Nazareth or where he is. You have no idea. It's got no interest in geography at all. Um, and so that's that's fairly typical of these things, that they're trying to latch on to the Jesus brand to use it to push their teaching, but they, they're not at all attached to Jesus historically. And, and uh, uh, so, so the, the, the substance of the four Gospels that we hold on to is really quite different than these other Gospels that, that have come about. And some would say that that, oh, well, there was a lot of Gospels and these were down selected in 200 and something AD. Tell me about that. Yeah, so that doesn't work at all. Um, the four Gospels uh, are all prior to the other one. So they are the earliest Gospels. Even a skeptic like Bart Ehrman will say that these are the, the earliest um, uh, Gospels. And um, it's not that there was ever a big long list of gospels which some powerful group in the church selected four from. Rather, those four gospels are widely accepted at an early stage. So there's a manuscript from southern Egypt from around the year 225, which has got all four gospels in, uh, Papyrus 45. Um, so that's in southern Egypt. Then in uh, Syria, you've got a man called Tatian who around the year, let's say 175 approximately, makes a diatessaron, which means through four. It's a, a harmony of the fourfold gospels. Um, and then around the year 180, 185, you have Irenaeus in, uh, in Lyon in France, saying having the four gospels is like having four winds, four cardinal directions. So there you've got Syria, France, Southern Egypt, all widely spread, spread apart all having four Gospels before there is any central power base for Christians. This is way before the Emperor Constantine comes along or anything like that. Um, the four Gospels are established and you can probably push it back earlier. Um, Justin Martyr around the year uh, in the 160s uh, arguably uh, has um, John and uh, the Synoptics, uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Sometimes it's hard to distinguish between, uh, between them. Uh, and I, I think you can uh, sh see signs of the use of these Gospels at a much, much earlier stage. Um, and the apocryphal Gospels just generally seem to come from after that. They are copycat Gospels. And the Gospel of Thomas even is talking about whether circumcision is profitable. Well, that's a, a, a conversation taken straight from Paul. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that it knows the Gospels, it also knows Paul's letters. Um, so I, I would say these things, the apocryphal Gospels are clearly later. Mm -hmm. Now, I come from a secular Jewish home, and, and my wife is a Gentile, and she says, every time we have a discussion, you right away say, how much did it cost? So finance is very important to mm -hmm. us. And so are the Gospels Jewish? Tell us about local languages, customs. Are they, are they Jewish in, in, in their tenor? 
Yeah, so, I mean, just to put another uh, thing on onto your question, of course, it costs money to produce a gospel because you need the papyrus or the leather that you're going to write on and uh, it, it, because everything's copied out by hand. Could you tell this to Shireen when we meet her? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is, sure. This, these are um, important qualities. Uh, 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 but you also see uh, that one of the clear things you've got in the gospels is the tax system. I mean, you know, this, things that are certain in life are death and taxes. And uh, what we have is a lot of interaction between Jesus and tax collectors. And so there in Matthew and Mark, you have a story about Jesus sitting down with lots of tax collectors in Capernaum for a meal. Now, Capernaum is at the top of the Sea of Galilee, and it's on a territorial boundary. That's exactly where people were taxing on a route. Whether you're coming across the Sea of Galilee or around the top of the Sea of Galilee, that's where you need to have lots of tax collectors. That's in Matthew and, and Mark. But in Luke, doesn't mention that at all, but it has this chief tax collector, chief toll collector, uh, Zacchaeus, and he's further down south at Jericho. And again, Jericho is a frontier city as you're coming over the Jordan, and that's exactly where you need to have a lot of tax collectors and therefore a chief over them. And, and you really can't avoid it. I mean, it would be more than your time is worth to try and go around that. So that's where um, the toll collectors are. Um, that's an example of getting information uh, correct, of course. There are other things that are correct economically, like um, the a denarius as a day's wage. We, we see uh, that sort of information um, in, in Jesus' uh, uh, story uh, of, of the, of the labourers. Um, you, you get other sorts of um, information which just show what's going on. The, the two, um, the, the temple tax in um, Matthew chapter 17. Again, it shows knowledge of the fact that you do have to pay not just tax to the Romans or their underlings, uh, their, 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 their client chiefs, you also have to pay uh, towards uh, the temple. So all of these sort of things are, are correct. Yeah, when I, when I read the Gospels, to me, they are so Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people say, you, you know, uh, Jew, you're a Jew and, 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 uh, and you believe this stuff? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like, how can you be a Gentile and believe this? I mean, this is more believable for me because it's so Jewish. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, are, there, are there local languages and things that, that come out from this? Yes. Yeah, so again, that's a very impressive thing because getting local language information is very non-trivial. You couldn't, if you're in Rome, just go into a bookshop and get an Aramaic dictionary. And it's not on the internet. <laughs> it's not on the internet. So when you have, say, the name Gethsemane, which um, Geth uh, means a press and Semani relates to Shem in the word oil, um, uh, and that's on the Mount of Olives, where, of course, you have olive oil. That's a very impressive piece of knowledge, or whether it's Golgotha or Gabbatha. Uh, Gabbatha, the stone uh, uh, pavement mentioned in uh, John's Gospel. So with the, those place names, with um, the things that Jesus says, whether it's uh, Abba for Father, but Ephatha, be opened, or Talitha Kum, uh, little girl, get up. Uh, all these sorts of things are showing knowledge of local languages, um, and there's even uh, a lovely case where um, Jesus calls two of his disciples in John's, uh, in Mark's gospel, uh, what usually comes out in English as Boanerges. Okay, and this is a bit like a Bostonian accent, you see, because Boane would be a way of saying Bune in Hebrew, sons of, uh, but it's got that nice um, uh, BW sound, what, uh, that you have in, in Boston. So um, that's... Uh, another just beautiful bit of uh, of uh, local feature that you get. God is so amazing. This is great. Tell me about undesigned coincidences. <laughs> well, this has been a name that's been around since about 1830 or so for cases where you've got two different records and they have some tiny details which dovetail and they are so subtle that you can't say the writers have put these details in in order to make their stories look authentic. It's the sort of thing that happens when two people just truthfully record things that happen, and that's why uh, they dovetail. So you can get these in the Old Testament, where, for instance, in, in, in Genesis, um, uh, Abraham's son Isaac, who's born really late on in Abraham's life, uh, marries a cousin who's one generation below him. 
um, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And that's a sort of dovetailing, but no one ever comments in, on that in the narrative. But these things also happen between the narratives. So uh, you, you will have um, where Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is praying to his father uh, in Mark's gospel, let this cup pass from me, which is the cup of, I think, suffering and based on Jeremiah, also the cup of God's anger. Um, and that's his prayer. And then uh, over in, in John's gospel, when uh, Peter tries to intervene to stop Jesus' arrest, Jesus, which doesn't, and it doesn't have anything about that prayer about let this mm -hmm. pass from me. Um, Jesus says to Peter, uh, shall I not drink the cup that's been given me? So in other words, there is, um, it's like he had cup on his mind. That would explain how you get this dovetailing between them. Or in um, John's gospel, in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, you've got the fact that this is happening near Passover time. Um, and in Mark's gospel, the whole reason they go to a deserted place is because lots of people are coming and going. Well, Passover time is the biggest time for commuting. It's the biggest festival of the year. So, of course, you'd need to get out of the way. And even the place where they are, which is mentioned only in Luke's gospel near, near Bethsaida, makes complete sense that they're getting out of the way at the big commute for Passover time. So that's the way in which different gospels uh, fit together to make a bigger picture um, and it's the sort of thing that it'd be very hard to fake. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, no, I see it that, that um, one gospel complements another on information that, 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 and, and so that's this undesigned coincidence. I think you mentioned someone in your book who was, it was in the 1800s. Yeah. That, that, so um, it, it, John J. Blunt yeah. wrote these books, undesigned, uh, undesigned uh, coincidences in Holy Scripture. And uh, he did it several volumes and then brought it together in a volume. More recently, that argument's been revived by someone called Lydia McGrew. Um, and uh, she's uh, written the book Hidden in Plain View, which does that. There is an earlier version of that, actually, by William Paley, the man who's famous for the argument uh, from design based on The Watchmaker, which, of course, Dawkins replies to in The Blind Watchmaker. Uh, and William Paley made this argument between... Um, Paul and the book of Acts, how are these undesigned co coincidences together? And also some with Josephus. So it has been around for a good while. Right. Now, now, how do we really know that we have the words of Jesus? <laughs> maybe they've been corrupted. Maybe the disciples made them up. How do we know? Well, there are several ways uh, we can uh, get at this. Um, and uh, I, I try to make the argument that, look, um, we've got actually more information on the words of Jesus than we have, say, of the most famous person at the time, namely the emperor, Tiberius, because we've got these four gospels and we're able to do archeology span between them and they, they, they um, uh, confirm each other. Of course, we've got to remember back then they didn't have quotation marks, speech marks. So they have slightly different conventions about how things um, uh, are said. But you also have to look at the fact that Jesus is recorded as speaking in parables, and early Christians aren't using parables uh, after him. Uh, and parables weren't very common at the time. You can then look at the content of the parables and you can actually say something like um, the 388 word story in Luke 15 of, of the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the two sons. It's a work of art as a whole. It doesn't work to say a committee made that up. It's got lots and lots of bit, uh, little details. Uh, it's a coherent story. And so you can't say that is Jesus plus someone else. And in the context, Jesus is having a dialogue with scribes, Pharisees, and there are uh, tax collectors and sinners there. So he's uh, talking uh, to people, a mixed audience of some of whom are not very devout at all, and some who are very devout, and some who are actually Bible experts. They copy out the Bible as, as their job. And what Jesus does is he tells a story which will work if you don't have any Bible background. And yet if you do have a Bible background, just like the Pixar movies where there are things for the adults as well as for the kids, it's like that. And so the story of these two sons, every single phrase is very carefully weighed. And it's a it takes on all the major stories from Genesis. So it's the, the, the father who runs uh, embraces and kisses his son. Uh, there's only one place in the Bible where that happens. It's Esau running, embracing and kissing uh, his brother Jacob, Genesis 33 verse 4. 
after his brother has ripped him out of his entire inheritance. Um, and that's a big challenge to the scri scribes and Pharisees because um, uh, they should be prepared to forgive. But also scribes had to write special dots over the word kiss. They, in part of their training is they had to know that verse really well because it's one of 10 places in the Torah where they have to write special dots over things. Um, so Jesus uses that. And of course, that's a story of a man has two sons. Well, who's the man in the Bible who most famously has two and only two sons? It's Isaac who has older brother Esau and younger brother Jacob and Jacob has to go off in the far lands and so on. So it's an amazing uh, depth to that. But it's not just that it has that. It's the story of Joseph because um, uh, the son comes back and he's given a ring on his finger and a robe, which is exactly what Pharaoh gives to Joseph in Genesis 41 verse 42, when he is uh, in the only other rags to riches, sudden rags to riches story in the Bible brought out. And he's the only other son who was dead and is alive again. So again, Jesus is really uh, clever with that. It's also the story of Laban, because when um, uh, Jacob runs away from Laban and Laban catches up with him uh, and what's what's Jacob do he gets angry and says all these 20 years I have worked for you and 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 so on which is exactly what the older brother says um, and it's got all sorts of details from that it's also the story of Cain and Abel the um, older brother uh, being jealous at the acceptance of the younger brother and it's the story of Abraham Who's the first person in the Bible to run? Abraham, Genesis 18. Who's the only other old man in the Bible to run? Genesis. Who's the first person in the Bible to say quick? Remember, he says quick, three sears of fine flour, and it runs off and gets the fatted yeah, calf, right. which is exactly yeah, what the right. father does. First words out of the father's mouth is quick. And we know Jesus is thinking about the three sears of flour because his shortest parable, Matthew 13, verse 33, is about a woman who takes uh, a yeast leaven, puts it into three sears of fine flour and, until it's all... Yielded. So we know Jesus is thinking about that verse. And the most obvious thing is because that's in Matthew and this story is in Luke, that it's one mind that comes up with those two parables. This is how we can show that the whole lot has to come from Jesus. It has to come from someone who knows the Bible really well, the Old Testament really well. He completely wipes the slate with the, the scribes. Yes. You know, I've, I've, I listened to your several part series on this. It's So you've got this series on the internet that says exactly what you just said, but but over a series of different uh, yeah. lectures, it was terrific that this story of the prodigal son has all of this depth that goes back to the patriarchs mm -hmm. and discusses this, and the scribes would get it. The scribes would see that they were the ones that would key in on these words. Or not. Or not. Or they not. might, they, they might they miss was... it. You know, I, I imagine some of the scribes might have been underwhelmed by Jesus' story which is just a, such a simple story, if you like. And, and they might not have seen the depth of this, even though they know the Bible well. A and they might have despised the simplicity of this. And this is the, the thing, that actually, when you think of it from the perspective of what it shows, it shows them up, it shows him to be the super clever one, and they really should be listening to him. But whether they did or not... Yeah, we yeah. don't know. And, and, well, they certainly didn't repent, mm -hmm. like, like, and... and uh... Well, they didn't welcome in the sinners like, like the father welcomed the son mm -hmm. back. But this is so like my Jesus. He can speak at a high level. He can speak to wherever you are at. Mm -hmm. He speaks to you. He mm -hmm. speaks to you and he addresses you. I share the gospel all the time. I shared, just shared today with, a, with an old Chinese woman. Couldn't even speak the same language. And there was somebody translating for us and she got it. She got the gospel message and boom, across cultures, across language, God speaks. It's so beautiful. Now, isn't, isn't the Bible just full of contradictions? The gospel just, it's just contradictions, right? Uh, so I think there's this phenomenon nowadays where people can try and catch people out uh, and Let's remember that we all sometimes contradict ourselves. That is, we use words, the same word in different ways, because that's the way we manage not to have absolutely vast dictionaries. We use words in different ways. And if you're wanting to come along and find fault, of course you can. So if someone wants to find fault with the Bible, they can. The, the fundamental question is, is it true? And what I find is there aren't any differences between the Gospels, which are so big that the two can't two cannot be true. For instance, it's not saying that Jesus was born in Egypt and he was also born uh, in, in, in Bethlehem and Israel. Th those sorts of things that you really couldn't fit together. There are no defeater difficulties, no defeater contradictions that you have uh, in the Gospels or in the Bible. 
but but he he uses some things sometimes contradictions as a way of 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 showing us the dichotomy. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah. yeah, that good Dickens quotation there. Well, and, this, and, I, this is from you. Yeah, I mean, and, and yeah. so Jesus does this particularly in John's Gospel. And I think a lot of teachers, good teachers, use paradox. Yes. So the question is this, are we going to say, no, Jesus is not allowed to use paradox. Like, that's forbidden. God is forbidden to use paradox. Who are you to say that? So, so I think Jesus actually deliberately uses paradox. If you look at John's gospel, you get plenty of examples of this where he'll say everything like, Son, I didn't come to judge the world and I, I came to judge the world. He says both. Um, and what you're meant to do behind that is you're meant to think more deeply what's going on. It's an invitation and you shouldn't just be walking. I mean, I, I don't know anything about quantum mechanics, but I understand it's difficult to fit it all together and people shouldn't give up in their first year in physics just because they can't fit it all together. There is a sense in which you have sufficient trust in the system to work at it to gain understanding. And I think it's the same as we come to scripture. If you expect to understand it all first time round, your expectations are wrong. You've got to adjust those. Um, and uh, God is a God who whose ways are higher th uh, than our ways are, and, and deeper and uh, we need to expect there to be things that our tiny little minds aren't going to understand uh, and uh, and we go forward with trust. Is that an invitation to be irrational? No, it's an invitation to recognise the limits of your mind and it's very rational to recognise the limits of your finite mind. Yes, uh, that, that's a great example with quantum mechanics that, that an electron can be in multiple places at once and we just learn to accept it because this system works. But the first time you hear it, you're like, how can this be? Either it's here or it's there. It's either it's on this atom or it's on that atom. No, you can't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it, it, more, it may be more here than there, but it's still there. And, and, uh, and, and so to tell me about this now. Um, uh, isn't there a motivation for the gospel writers just to make up these miracles and the biggest one of them being the resurrection. Why, why, why couldn't they just make it up? Well, you've got to think, how did Christianity get started? If you're a disciple and you want to start a religion, the best thing is not to let your leader get killed in the first place. If he does get killed by accident, you don't have very long to make up a message out of it. And uh, to make up the message, that, like he came back to life, that's a bit of an odd message to make up because at the end of the day, it's not very attractive in Roman terms to have someone come back physically. Uh, they would think it far more acceptable to go off to some realm of spirit or mind. But anyway, even if you do that, you struggle with the fact that the Gospels complement the beginning of the Bible. So everyone agrees the Gospels are written by different people from <laughs> who wrote the beginning of the Bible, Genesis. What's your opening sort of scene in Genesis? Um, it is this uh, tree of life uh, and uh, there is a tree of knowledge of good and evil and death comes through that. And your climactic scene in the New Testament is about a tree. That's what a cross is. And uh, Christ dying and coming back to life. And what's so, uh, uh, to give us life. Now, what's uncanny is if Christianity comes about by some big accident how on earth you manage to get such an epic storyline that fits with the beginning of the jewish scriptures and if you are a, a a disciple trying to make up a new religion it's really nice that the material like falls into shape in your hands <laughs> you you have uh, the beginning of the jewish scriptures that just happens to fall in line uh, with the way uh, romans executed people uh, th this is, wow, that's quite a coincidence. And the fact that this happens like at Passover time, uh, when it's the greatest Jewish festival, uh, and it, 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 there are just so many things that don't quite work it, to, to have it made up. And that doesn't explain how people um, come to, well, there's, there's no body, and the body's missing. Uh, and also you have lots of different people saying they saw Jesus risen from the dead. Now, with the resurrection and maybe sort of anticipating a question here, but um, it's that pincer movement of the fact that there is no body plus the 
varied resurrection appearances. Those are two lines of evidence, but there's a third line that goes with it. This doesn't just happen to any old Joe. This happens to someone who had previously chosen 12 disciples that sounds rather like he's trying to re-establish Israel. This is comes to someone who already had lots of followers and uh, was expected to be the Messiah. This happens to someone who happened to come up with amazing stories that have lasted till now. It comes up with things like the golden rule, do unto others what you'd have them do to you. Um, and all of these sorts of things are converging on the person of Jesus. And there comes a point where you start saying, just appealing to these as as individual incidental things that uh, just happen through happenstance isn't a good enough explanation. There's something more designed happening about all of this. Okay, well, I have one more question, but I'm gonna ask that last because we've got a few people here with us in the studio and um, uh, I want to open it up for questions. You're not going to be able to see them, but uh, they're here in the studio and they have a microphone. And l let them fire away because uh, some of these guys have studied apologetics and philosophy, nothing I ever have. So their, their questions are going to be harder. Hi. Uh, really appreciate uh, the talk. This is the opportunity to be here in your work. Um, so my question is... Um, for a, a faith, um, a book that itself claims that revelation or purity of heart is what is required to see God, do you see any danger in the increasing reliance of modern Christians on scholarship or the historical critical method for biblical truth and interpretation, as opposed to something like uh, church fathers or church tradition? Should we primarily be looking to the scholars or to the saints? Well, that's a great question. I think it's really important to recognize the thing that the Gospels report, and that is that Jesus was convicted by the highest scholarly court. <laughs> it was the Sanhedrin that condemned him. Uh, and that is a really interesting thing, because what we realize is that scholars don't tend to be um, very brave. Lots of uh, scholars aren't. Some are. Uh, very brave, but man, many are not. They can often work in a group and they can often do the wrong thing. Scholars in Nazi Germany were no resistance to Hitler. They'd often just go along with it. Uh, and so what we've got to recognize is that um, you can't decide what's true based on what a whole load of scholars think, because scholars tend to be pretty compliant with the zeitgeist. Um, so you will find scholars in communist countries generally going along with uh, that scholars in fascist countries generally going along with that Sc scholars in uh, secular western countries generally going along with that that's what scholars do they tend to go along with the zeitgeist not all of them but a lot of them uh, so if we are looking to scholars to establish uh, what what is true here there's a problem now there is one thing that scholars do have and they have it in abundance and that is expertise but their expertise is not something that is able to stand aside from the whole pressures of human nature they are fallen sinful humans and so we all want to um, listen to experts but also cross-examine experts that is we we want uh, to have access to the, the deep knowledge that they have through often decades of familiarity with material but we're also um, quite aware of the gender uh, agendas and personal interests that they may have and that's why you don't just uh, when some scholar rocks up to support a pharmaceutical company in a lawsuit. You don't think, oh, well, they're a scholar. They must be right. They need to be cross-examined. And you may well find uh, that uh, their evidence doesn't stack up. So I think it's, it's uh, problematic to start thinking of uh, scholars as the, um, the test of truth. And particularly one of the things you get in the Bible uh, is this uh, thought particularly in 1 Corinthians but the 1st Corinthians and other places too where you have um, the thought that um, God is going to show up the wisdom of the scholars and the experts so I, I but I think just this this central scene uh, that we have with the Sanhedrin convicting Jesus is something that should give us pause about that thank you hi Dr. Williams thank you so much for um, giving this talk I'm really excited to uh, read Jesus' parables again, just from hearing you say everything you just did. Um, I have a very quick question. I wanted to go back to something you said about Simon the Zealot, and you just mentioned in passing that, oh, sometimes he's called Simon the Canaanite, and there's a linguistic 
mm-hmm. uh, connection there. And I just thought that was interesting, if you wouldn't mind unpacking that. Yeah, so there are two different spellings of Canaanite. One is C-A-N-A-A-N-I-T-E. They're the Canaanites from Canaan, uh, the or descendant from uh, Canaan, uh, uh, son of Ham, uh, and they're the sort of land of Canaan, Canaanites. This Canaanite is spelt C-A-N-A-N-I-T-E. So it's only got two A's rather than three in the word as a whole. And that uh, comes from a particular Hebrew root, kana, which means to be zealous or jealous for something. And so that's what the word is. So the Greek term would be a uh, someone who's a zealot. And there's a bit of debate about when people first start getting called zealots. At least uh, a few decades later, it's used for a particular group who are all up for fighting the Romans. Maybe it's used at this earlier stage in that way. Uh, but certainly it's, it relates to this word, uh, kana, to be zealous. That's the word also used for Phineas in the Old Testament, being zealous for God. That's it. Thank you. So all four of the Gospels that we have in the New Testament are anonymous. Um, so why should that not give us pause as as believers in, in the New Testament scriptures? Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would dispute the, the premise of the question. I think uh, that none of the four Gospels are anonymous. I think they all come named. So the fact is they don't have the name within the main text, but then neither does my book. Uh, my, my, my book, uh, Can We Trust the Gospels, has the name on the front cover and, 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 and so on. Um, uh, so the idea that the Gospels were ever anonymous is purely theoretical. As far back as we have manuscripts, they are uh, they have names on it. it might be in the running header which doesn't have to be every page but every few pages you get a running header or it might be at the beginning or at the end or both and Simon Gathercole, Dr Simon Gathercole has done a uh, published study uh, on this and the other thing we can say is that generally when people had uh, ancient books they want to have some m- means of recognizing what they are so that's one reason people actually wrote on the books what they were and from uh, Pompeii, which of course is preserved through the eruption of Vesuvius, you actually can see as a uh, wonderful picture of a jar with little labels on the um, on on the scrolls uh, called Situ Boy, uh, which were the labels you'd put for, for the name on. So I don't think there's any reason to think that they were anonymous. And something like Luke's Gospel is dedicated to Theophilus. Clearly, Theophilus knew who was writing to him. Uh, John's Gospel, he comes in as an I and a we uh, in uh, in the book, clearly presupposing that uh, the people he's writing to uh, knew who he is. Um, and the traditions, again, about who wrote the four Gospels are, are very early. Um, so I take it that the four Gospels are by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That's not revolutionary. Um, and that the attestation that they are by those four authors is better than we have for many classical works that we don't doubt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for coming for talking with the questions. Is that it? Okay. So let's just let's just put a bow on this thing. Sum this up for us. What are the implications or the importance of the gospels in our lives? As as people who love Jesus, what are the implications? And to the unbeliever, what are the implications of the gospel? Well, if Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent in the world into the world to reveal who God is, to show by embodying who God is, and to um, rescue us from our sins by dying and rising again, then there are all sorts of uh, just implications for us. Firstly, that we can know who God is. He's a speaking God. Uh, secondly, that we are extremely guilty. We're not different from the people who convicted uh, Jesus back then. We're in rebellion uh, against him. Uh, Thirdly, that uh, God really loves us so much that he would send his own son uh, to die for us. And fourthly, that that means that we, just as uh, Christ's sacrifice was accepted and he he, um, uh, rose from the dead, uh, to show that he lives now and we can have a relationship with him um, because of his sacrifice. And so um, just so much good news there. Yes, I, I agree that Jesus is so wonderful. It's as if, as if God now funnels his love to us 
through Jesus, his mm-hmm. son. And, and, you know, I'm in my, in my own personal time right now, I happen to be in the minor prophets. And I see, I see a God who I don't know where he's talking about the judgment that's going to come upon people. And I don't know a God like that. I know that he, he, he responds like that at times in history. I personally don't know a God like that because of this prism of Jesus Christ, who his light comes to me through Jesus, who has paid the price for me. And I can cry out and call him Abba Father. Mm-hmm. So it's like a child of a great general. This great general may do devastating things to to the enemy but the child comes up and just says daddy and climbs up in their lap and doesn't know this other side of and that's the way i feel that that because of jesus because of his goodness because of his kindness because of the radiance of god coming through this prism of jesus all i see is love and kindness and graciousness and when i go astray he just so gently pushes me back he's not ripping my belly open and Mm -hmm. and he just so kindly drawing me by the by by the goodness of Jesus as is, as the scriptures say it is the kindness of God that draws us to repentance and Jesus lives he lives to make intercession on our behalf that Jesus would live to pray for me i mean th- this son of god and so the implications of the gospel are so clear this reaches everybody. I share this with everybody, with PhDs, with physicians, with professors. And the gospel works every time and cuts through. This message just goes through to everybody mm-hmm. because it's been written and designed by God. How could it not work? Mm-hmm. And it goes through and it touches the heart. Jesus is so magnificent. And that's why forever and ever we will be praising him. And eternity won't be long enough to praise my Jesus. He is Absolutely. so wonderful. Absolutely. So wonderful. Well, Dr. Peter J. Williams, you have been tremendous. I wish I knew what you knew, what you know about Hebrew and Greek and all these little things. It would just add all these other dimensions to the the Word of God. Thank you for joining us and for coming all the way from Cambridge, England to share with us. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising. But if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible. And you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation. And there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.